Mindset Mashup Podcast, here we are. And today is a first because we've got a, a returning guest on the podcast. Uh, we decided that five minutes just wasn't enough. There was just, there was too much value. So uh, if you don't know this guy already, go before you listen to this, just go and check the five minute podcast uh, because the, the value he gave in five minutes, we're about to dive into more detail today. And listen, if you've got your own business, I want you to go and get your notepad because we're going to give you some real actionable points um, that you can go away and implement right away. Um, so yeah, without further ado, welcome George Sullivan, owner of Soul Supplier. Um, thanks again for coming on, man. It's an, it's an honour. Thanks, George. That's a lot of pressure you put me under there. It's a, oh, listen, uh, pressure's your middle name. Yeah. <laughs> pressure, pressure's your middle name, man. Uh, uh, we've we done one podcast already. I, I know the value they're going to get. So, um, well, the, the funny thing is, I was just talking to someone for the last two hours about the business story and the, the, the culture and everything else. It was a it was a long call, so I'm warmed up, man. I'm ready. Yeah, that's 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 great. That's that's <laughs> yeah. uh, you've basically done a podcast. You just come from one podcast to another. So, um, mm. look, George, let's go back to the beginning because we didn't we didn't sort of quite quite get that in the five minute episode. So, um, yeah. why did you decide to start the Soul Supplier? So, for anyone that doesn't know, my name's George Sullivan. I'm the CEO and founder of the Soul Supplier, which is the UK and Europe's largest platform for people to find and buy in-demand sneakers and clothing, in particular streetwear. So we help millions a month find the best shoes and show you where you can buy all of them, right? So if you like your trainers, please have a look at the site. But my story started as an original. I was a sneakerhead, man. Ten years ago, I got the sneaker bug. And at the same time, and how long have we got, George? I don't know, because I want to make sure I give you the most like concise answers as possible. Well, how long is the podcast? Uh, I'm, 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 not too, hour, right? I'm, not, I'm not too worried, man. I'm, I'm not All too right. worried. Yeah. So this, the, the, the short story on it is, is that I was kicked out of school at 17. Whilst my friends were going to uni, everything else, I was pretty depressed because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. But my dad's always said to me, you don't want to work a nine to five. My mum's always been like, you should work hard. So I've got these two conflicting opinions, but two very good parents, right? They want the best for me. But I've been thrown out of school. The prospects weren't looking too good. I've had probably 10 jobs from 17 to 24. And my parents fell on hard times. It was a 2008 recession. So they had no money around them. They had to sell their house and go and rent. It was peak times for finances for us. So... At 24, I got a job in recruitment. But whilst I've been going through all those different jobs, I've been learning a lot about the web because my dad always said to me, the internet is going to be the biggest thing. He said that from when I was 10 years old. My dad missed the mobile phone era. So he was like, make sure you don't miss the internet era. So I've been reading little books that, like, and tuning into technology from when I was younger, right? So at around 22, just before the recruitment job, I'm earning money in sales, because I thought that was the quickest way to make money. And I'm buying trainers every time I get my commission. My dad's like, why are you buying so many shoes? Stop wasting your money. What did I tell you? He said, like, you see what happened to us sometimes? Like, finances weren't always there and you're spending all your money on trainers. I'm like, don't worry, dad. I've got a plan. I didn't have a plan. <laughs> I didn't have a plan. All I knew was a fair bit about the web and the trainer game. So I got this job in recruitment, making a bit more money. I decided, right, one year, one year, I'm going to go sober, stop drinking, stop going out, stop going on holidays. And I didn't, I didn't set my intention to come up with a business idea, but I wanted to do something for myself. And I knew that the way to do that was to be able to have more time, more money and more energy. So the sensible thing to do at the time was to stop drinking. And I was drinking a fair bit since I left school. So I'd had enough at that point anyway. I stopped what drinking. age was this? Like what, how, how old were you? 24 when I stopped drinking for the mm. first time for like a long period of time. So it's quite young in society's eyes because at that point, everyone's yes. going out. That's, I mean, I know for me, that was the peak of my sort of going out and getting wavy and things like 100%, that. 100%, so, man. Yeah, yeah. I was going out getting wavy as well. Like I was, yeah, we was having it at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, my parents are like, what is going on? I was their only son. And they were like, you're throwing it all away. 
Mm. Um, I tried to start businesses from when I was like 17 as well. When I was 14, 15, I was selling CDs at school with my mate Bav. We were downloading music off LimeWire and Kazaa. <laughs> yeah. And Kazaa was the one before LimeWire. And then we burned the CDs on our old big like towers. Like my parents had one with the CD burner. I was like, mum, make sure you get the CD burner. And uh, burning these CDs. So I started stuff at school. I, I tried to fit, have a videography business when I was like 20 for filming properties, uh, filming properties like luxury properties. That was too much money involved in that. I couldn't do it. There was a lot of sales needed. I just did not have the skills or experience. Tried to start a shoe repair delivery business, which was like, you know, when you was at school, you had to get your shoes sometimes repaired. Or yeah, something. the soles are hanging off or yeah. something like that. Yeah, you yeah. take them to the shoe repairer. Yeah, mm. I, I say to this guy, Danny, in South London in this shoe store, I'm going to hire a car. Um, this was like when I was like 17, 18 after I left school. I'll hire the van and I'll pick up people's shoes and then drop them off. You'll fix them. Bought the domain name. That didn't really go anywhere. Um, so you've always had that. It sounds like that entrepreneurial spirit has always been part of your journey coming from uh, sort of like you come from a middle class family, just like just like myself. Um, absolutely. But it sounds like your your mindset and certainly from what you just said about your, your dad's mindset was definitely he sounds like he didn't want that middle class lifestyle, that middle class mindset for you. 100%. So like my dad was uh, out of Deptford, worked his way up in the print industry. My mm. mum was out of uh, Gravesend, worked her way up as a legal secretary. Mm. She lived in like a modest three bedroom terraced house. Yeah. And things were okay. Um, not when the recession hit, that was an absolute shit time, but things were generally okay, right? So, but I, I always wanted to do something for myself. My dad was always like, don't, you don't want a nine to five. Um, so the, the the thing I need to mention in this story, which is where my hunger started, and it's very important because hunger is a big thing for a lot of people. Motivation, right? My hunger started when that financial hardship fell on my parents. Because yeah. before that, there was always a bit of money to borrow off my parents. I had to have a part-time job at the local gym, uh, serving drinks behind the bar at the local gym. But I was still able to borrow a bit of money off my parents. I didn't really have to pay any rent into the house. When that happened... That changed everything. I was like, if I need, if I want money now, if I want to make it in this world, I need to earn. Like, so it was that, it was that thing of that created the hunger. And I was around some kids at my school that had a lot of money, and they'd get their first car when they were seventeen years old. It would be the brand new BMW, like the BMW One M. I was like, this is wild. My parents were like, cars not available. You're gonna have to earn, go out and earn. To buy a so car. you started to recognize do you think it's fair to say that you recognize the value of money or did you just start to realize the significance of money because although not coming from you haven't come from sort of a, a rich, rich family when it's always there you might not recognize the true value or the significance of what it can do so do you felt that's what started to really like resonate with you well i'd always had a good i'd have a, i'd have a good understanding of money because I'd always be reading a lot about it when I was younger. And like, I wanted to learn more about it because my dad always instilled that in me. And I'd learned a lot from his financial failures through, through being in sales and having different jobs and his successes as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so, but, but when, when you're faced with, my parents had to sell their house, they couldn't afford the mortgage. We had to rent. And at that point I was like, they're having to rent. My dad's lost his job. Oh, hold on a minute they're gonna actually be working for the next for the rest of their lives at this rate and it, that motivation for me was like i better fucking work something out because if i don't they're gonna they're in a bit of a shit time right now what what's what, what's our family gonna come to was the with the motivator so it was like my family and more hunger for money it wasn't just the, the want for like material possessions. It was like, I need to do this for my family. Look at what they've done for me. Mm. I need to look after them now. It's my time. I love that. That's so powerful. And I can definitely relate to that myself as well. Seeing other people go through things and the, because you know, we all know that although money isn't everything in this world and that's really common now, but it would be silly to neglect that. It's not a big part of our world and watching the people that we love have financial struggles. We can see the impact it has on relationships on, um, when I say freedom, I don't mean freedom as in, 
do whatever you want all the time, like freedom to go to a theme park or to buy stuff or to borrow money or or that. So I could definitely see that. So the hunger starts kicking in. Um, you really, you're, you're like, right, I, I need to make something of myself. I want to bail something. I want to bail my family out, basically. I want to do something that my family are proud of and I can Absolutely. help them. So when when did the soul supplier idea come to light or did a few things happen before that point? Yeah, so... Back to what I was saying about like that period of one year, right? I start to realize I need the time, the money and the energy. So it's cutting out the booze is a big one. It's a quick win. Because whilst everyone's out there spending their Saturdays in bed, I'm up working on the website. But anyway, I've got this idea. Uh, I'm on the sneak ahead. I'm buying stuff and I'm reselling it as well. I've got a pop in eBay account. I'm reselling vintage clothes as well. So... I'm trying to make extra money as well as my commission. And a lot of people are asking me, I could say hundreds over a period of a few months, where'd you get that shoe? How did you secure that? What retailers got that? And I'm like, it dawns on me. I read this book called The Book of Entrepreneur's Wisdom. And the book says, um, the best ideas don't always have to be original. They just could be, they could be something that you've seen out there and you can do a better job of it. And the other chapter in this book, which really struck me was, um, the biggest uh, reason that people don't get their businesses off the ground is because they don't start. Hmm. And like that one hit me and I was like, I'm going to start a website. I know a bit about building a WordPress site. I've tried to before. I'm going to launch the website off my own back. When, every evening I'm going to try and work on it. So that was it. I, I, I bought the soulsupplier.co.uk and... I set the website up every evening. I was working on it to try and get it to where it needed to be. I had 10 grand saved at this point and I was paying a bit of rent to my parents as well. So everything was kind of looked after and I was able to work on it every evening. Uh, the girl I was with at the time, I said, I'm not going on holiday. I'm not buying anything. I'm just going to come home and work on this. You're not going to see me. That was exactly what I did. Um, so it's that sacrifice, man. This is like, yeah, that cliche, but this is true. What you need to do in these early stages. And because it's not easy, you need to be competitive. And a few things I wrote down this morning, you need to be able to think you need money and you need time. If you're working full time, they are all a, a struggle. So, so yeah, no, and that's I, I completely agree. And that's I mean, we started off the conversation before the recording about sort of me going self-employed, which is mm -hmm. I, those three things. They're definitely things I've gained and I can feel more energy, but I want to come back. So you just, you said there, you said um, thinking, money and what was, and time. Is, uh, those thinking, are the three things that you just said. Yeah, the ability to think and the ability, the, the, the ability to think and you need time and money. And so stopping drinking alcohol for a lot of young people will save them a lot of money. It will save, it will give them time back and it will give them more energy. So you'll have a, a better ability to think. Which, so, yeah. so let's go, let's, I sort of want to break down those because I, I completely agree. Mm. I think, I think one of the biggest things, so over the last, I've been running the Real Talk George page now for three years. I've done it because I wanted to meet new people and I wanted to get a story out there. My past has been sort of drug use and involved in uh, some criminal activity. And I wanted to change that and I wanted to get around. I wanted to get around different people and to learn new things and get a message out there that if you put your mind to something, you, anything, anything's possible. Anyway, I, I've sort of, throughout the three years, I've tried various different things and one thing I've noticed is that the clearer my the clearer my thinking gets, the clearer I get on what is it what what is it I want to do, and um, that's become more niche. So when you talk about thinking, yeah, um, I think time has definitely got a big element on the quality of the thoughts that you have. Yes, but for someone either starting a business or in business, what sort of thinking, what sort of thoughts would you say this? would have been valuable to you if you were to go back in time that you would recommend someone to start thinking about if mm. they were getting into business or already have one? So my experience is when I was younger, I didn't cultivate my thinking. Uh, you shared a little bit there about going out reckless criminal activity with different stories, right? But my, when I was younger was probably similar to some degrees, but varying levels, but it was just like, I was I was kind of like doing anything to escape the reality, mm. uh, to escape the thinking. 
And as you go on in life, what should happen is you get more experience, you meet people like you mentioned, and you start to become a bit more self-aware and improve your thinking. And now I'm at a point where I think I'm at my best thinking state that I've ever been, the ability to generate insights. Now, how do I do that? My main ways that I keep my thinking sharp, which I never did when I was younger, apart from uh, those periods where I'd stop drinking and really focus, was what do I do now? We keep it simple. You've got to try and sleep well. You've got to eat well. You've got to exercise. And for me, with my overactive mind, I meditate. The amount of insights I get from doing those things. Yeah. Yeah. The amount of like, the amount of observation I can have, the amount of focus I can have. But just take it back to starting a business. If you've got money and you've got time, but you can't think, you're not going to be able to put your business into action. If you've got a good idea and you're struggling to think and you can't focus, you're going to struggle again. So you could come up with a good idea, but most people, again, they, they struggle to implement because they're distracted. They've got other priorities. They just don't have the time to think and focus. So the whole point about like practicing your thinking and how do you cultivate that each day to be in a good state is so important, man. It's all about routines as well that you set yourself up because uh, we all have heard this saying, this is a cliche, that you can't pour from an empty cup. Now, if we were to put that into a business perspective like you can't think about your business if you haven't got time to cultivate the right thoughts because we know the world is faster than ever now everything's moving at an extremely fast level and in order to keep up with it our thinking needs to be sharp yes. and in order for our thinking to be sharp we can't be drained of energy we can't i don't care you can't be under the influence you you, mm. you have to be mentally sober physically sober and in my opinion, I, you mentioned exercise there. Um, I've never been big on exercise. Over the last four years, I've exercised religiously daily, and it has it's a lot more than a physical workout, let's just say that. Mm. And so I think definitely making that, that, that time to, to think, which anyone can do, whether you're in a full-time job, part-time job, or self-employed, but you mentioned about the time and money as well. So do you... What about this one, though, George, before go on. you go move on to the time and money for the focus, right? In this world where everyone's scrolling TikTok, everyone's on Instagram, yeah. everyone's attention span is dwindling. The people that can focus their mind and keep it focused have the competitive advantage. Yeah. A, a, a 10 sec, what I think I read something the other day. I'm not 100% sure if this is true, but they reckon the average focus time now is between 10 to 30 seconds. <laughs> Yeah, and even if that is true, right, then fine, because the people that focus get the competitive edge. If yeah. you practice focus and you can really zone in and get valuable work done in a short amount of time, because this is what focus gives you. If you practice it, you start to become better at doing it, and you can get a good amount of work done in a short amount of time. So anyway, yeah, sorry, time of money. Where, where do you stand? Just before we go, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what it's always like, just before we go on to that, just yeah. before we go on to that. Where do you stand on, because obviously you run, you run a business and you have, have employees. Hmm. Where do you stand on time versus productivity? So how, how do you mean? Tell Sorry, me. that, but yeah, that was, that, 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 that was poor. So like, where do you stand on sort of like, right, you, you, you work seven hours a day, eight, eight hours a day versus, um, I think it's called ROWE, which is results only work environment. Yeah. Where, where do you stand on on that what's your, what's your thoughts there's always there's always periods of celebration there's always periods of rest there's always periods of hard work and resilience you got to be dynamic man i yeah. can't sit here and give you one the one steadfast rule for life because that would be wrong but what i can say is that everyone now must make a concerted effort to build their resilience because resilience is a dwindling thing now. I see more younger people than ever. I'm 31, but I see more younger people with less resilience and confidence than I ever have. And that means that you're going to be a lot less productive because as soon as a task gets hard or something gets yeah. hard, you check out of it mentally. So you've yeah. got to practice that. But um, for, so the, the answer for me is like, I've had periods where I've gone at it for weeks and weeks and I've, I've overtrained and I'm overstressed. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I need a rest. And then you take some rest and then you come back to it. Um, there'll be periods where I've got a whole different set of objectives and I'm not doing that much actual work, but I'm organizing things. And I might be doing that all day long, but it doesn't feel that stressful. Mm. So you need to, it, or it doesn't feel that much like work, but there's a lot going on. Um, so you've got to monitor it, each person. Like there's yeah. no right answer. Yeah. So you're sort of, it sounds like your opinion is there's times where you should be sort of results only focused, but there's times where you might just need to put in the time. You might just need to set yourself amount of hours that you're going to do something and, and, and do that. Yeah. And you should be able to do both. That's the, uh, yeah. one of my personal goals is like with fitness and with life is to be able to do anything at any time. Yeah. And I heard David Goggins say exactly this the other day, but that's my ethos. That's what he lives like. That's why he trains like he does. So he can just conquer any challenge at any time. And that's what I try and cultivate. So when a problem comes up at work, I can just attack it head on and it doesn't bother me. And there's been some things that have bothered me over the years and they just sit there for weeks. And you have to do a lot of thinking and work to, to understand why did that affect me? What, what was it attacking within me? Why did it bother me so much? And how do I improve that in the future to let go? Mm. Um, because when a problem's bothering you emotionally, it's, it's affecting you, then you're not productive with other stuff. Yeah, it translates. Yeah. It translates, transfers. And moving on to the money and time, I think a, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, a lot of people in business, maybe not in business, but definitely like early early entrepreneurs, I think one of something that I keep hearing is that they think capital is, a, they find capital being a problem. So when you talk about money, yeah. um, having money, what? I like this topic. What do you mean? Yeah. I like this topic because social, if we're talking about how we use capital in business and life, I was modest for a lot of years and I still am to this day. A lot of my friends sound very humble for where we've got to. And I'm, I'm happy with that because that's exactly where I want to be. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I don't live in the right way. It doesn't mean that I don't live good and I enjoy my life. It doesn't mean that I'm frugal and I don't look after my people around me. It doesn't mean that I don't buy nice things. But what it means is, is that the business is priority number one. It means that every year, nearly, we are breaking even or deliberately making a small loss. The revenue's grown thousands of percent over the last eight years, right? But I'm investing back in right now into the development team and into the growth of the marketplace so we can take that to the US. There's always things to invest in. There's always things to spend money on. And trust me, if you've bought a Lamborghini because you start doing well in business and you started stunting in the latest Gucci and you've got an AP on your wrist and you're broke at 40, 50 because you've done all of that, you are going to be pissed. You are going to be looking back pissed that you did all of that. So you have to put your business finances before anything personal. And I've always lived like that. And you do that to you do that to grow the business, but what does that do for, for you as, as an individual? Is that what sort of, is that enough for you? Do you ever feel like, oh, I mean, I suppose the question is, do you feel deprived? You're depriving yourself for doing that. No, no this is, this is the important thing people have to know as well. There's a lot of people out there on social media that will be projecting the life of have multiple cars, have multiple women. That's all good fun, but it's such an incremental amount of yeah. pleasure or happiness at the top. The first 90% of improving your quality of life is uh, getting a nice place to live, um, being able to look after yourself and your family and your people, is being able to buy things that make you feel good, like good food and go to the gym. This is the 90% of happiness and quality of life. That myth of money doesn't make you happy. Trust me for that first 90%. It makes your quality of life better, which will make you happier. You've got to have gratitude as well with that. Like that, make, that will make you happier. The rest of it, the extra cars, the Lambo, the big mansion, all of that stuff, it's, it's, such, it's, it's small. It doesn't solve what's going on up here. So when you say money, time, money and thinking... What what, yeah. what what does the money mean when you say that? What, what are you just all, yeah. What do you mean when you say that? What I'm talking about is with the money, if you're trying to start a business or if you're trying to be secure in life, you want a level of money in the bank 
or you want a level of money and cash flow within your business so it's running in a healthy way. Mm. So what I mean by that is, what do you need to change in your life? And if we go back to that material example, if you're 24 and you're earning money in recruitment, and the first thing you want to buy is a Rolex so you can stunt your pals in recruitment, it's the wrong intention because you're sacrificing your money, which will therefore sacrifice your thinking ultimately because you have to make other sacrifices. You're sacrificing the rest of your life for the Roly to stunt. And it's the wrong reason. You can stunt in the future when you've got financial security, when you've got good cash flow in your business and life. But trust me, the stunting comes last. So what you're saying is that you need to prior you need to be intentional about where your finances are going when you're yeah. early in business. And to be honest, that message can go out to anyone. And it, it like here's an interesting thing. I believe that money doesn't solve money problems. Um I I believe that it doesn't matter how if you if you can't manage a thousand pounds, I don't believe you can manage two, three, four, five, two thousand two hundred thousand because if you can't manage it, it would always just compound and compound into something you can't manage. So I, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that message. And so let, let's move on to time and then move on to another to another area that I want to get into. So talk to me about time. So those three sort of like that, that, that triangle that you just mentioned there, when you say time's important, why, what time are you talking about? Time... Time is a finite resource in the modern world, especially in the digital world where there's so many distractions. So think about this. Let's use this uh, thought example. Put your phone at home for the day and go out of your house to work. Log how many times you want to check your phone. <laughs> Calculate. Off the back of that, if I want to check my phone 20 times an hour, I might use it for a minute at a time. You use your phone for 20 minutes each hour. How much of that time is productive on your phone? I would argue probably five to 10%. If you're not running a business, it's it's probably less, right? I, I used to justify, I use my phone so I've got a business, but I can run my business without my phone. Because again, using a phone to try and run your business, unless it's just communication and updates, can be very difficult. It's not effect, efficient. Sit at a computer and run your business. Yeah. Yeah, go into the office and run your business. But anyway, 20 minutes an hour. Imagine how much that is a day. That's like 35, 40% of your time a day spent on your phone, of your waking hours. So that's why we have to be objective about what we're doing with our time because you can just get little wins back by that. Get a Nokia. Just don't have a smartphone. You get time back. Stop boozing for a few months. You get time back. You know what I'm saying? All so you're, you So basically you're saying give time to... It's funny because they're so interlinked, aren't they? All three of them are so interlinked. So I completely understand how you go by that. You're saying give time to yourself so you can think properly. Yeah. It, be intentional about where you're, where you're putting your finances. So if a business really is your priority, mm. then you need to be intentional about what you're doing with, uh, what you're doing with your money and not mm. be wondering why the business is suffering if you're not looking to invest it. Um, and then the, the you mentioned time. I suppose that just have give yourself time, whether that's time away from your phone, time away from the pub, time away from your friends. Maybe yeah. more time back to you, more time back to your business, your employees, or whatever. So that makes that 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 makes perfect sense. And then, in regards to the early, I want to stay stay in the early parts of your business. What yeah? What were some of your what were some of your biggest challenges? Biggest challenges for me was scaling my thinking to be more ambitious i've been brought up in a humble way and that led me to having to step up my ambition level every time where i thought i was at like a certain point i was grateful and i was there we had we had done x amount with the business we had started making x amount of revenue and it took me a minute let's say a few months a bit of encouragement from say my best mate dan that i work with to step that thinking up to the next level um and to get out of your comfort zone you so you what you're saying is you couldn't think past what you thought was capable because of the con conditions yeah. of what has happened in your life basically yeah yeah because in the early days of success and i grew up with my family and like i say they were a great family like looked after me there wasn't loads of money flying about and that meant that we we had a level of living and i saw other levels and the level of living was nice it was loving but that means that 
sometimes your ambition level, you need to work on that to get it to where it needs to be because it your business might be able to be so much more. You might just be thinking thinking in a smaller way. You might not be thinking big enough is the point. So how does that manifest from like a business perspective? What, what uh, How is that manifesting in your day-to-day activities as, and what you're doing? As an example, um, we've been self sustainable and profitable for eight years i say profitable breaking even there or thereabouts when i say self-sustainable we've never taken investment if i look back and i knew what i knew now about the market size the market opportunity um how powerful our website was at the time i might have taken investment because i know how much i could have accelerated it but my ambition level uh, because of my conditioning wasn't there. So I had to work a lot to kind of remove that conditioning to be more ambitious. And it's an it's an activity that I do every day now. Now we've got these like big vision goals of like, we want the business to be the only place you need to find your next piece of footwear. We want it to be worth over a hundred million. We want X, you know, you've got these big picture goals and they're clear and I see how we get there. I never had that when I was younger. It was just like, we need to get to, 10 grand in revenue we need to get to 100 we need to get to a million we need to get to we need to get to this many users on the site we need this many signups and you but you have to scale it i mean and so the, the the activity from that is you kept saying actionable insights at the start right so the insight or the action you people could take from that is um what is the biggest like most like hairy goal that you can have what's your biggest vision for yourself your business your career it's got a look in your head almost unachievable. Write it all down. Write it out vividly and start working backwards. You'll scale your ambition quicker doing that. Yeah, and I think that's such... I can truly relate to... You have, your mind has... It has this the ambition, the, the, the like, almost like the visualisation. I don't like some of these buzzwords, but it has to scale from where you're going because if... Otherwise, you're going to be stuck where you are or mm. procrastinate on achieving more because you believe sort of like, right, I'm at the top of where I can get to because subconsciously because of where I come from, because of what I believe in myself and my sort of self-identity. And when you sort of, when was that, when was that, by the way, how long did it take you to reach that sort of ceiling of like, right, I've got to change my, I've got to change the way I think about my business Happen, myself. George, George, at various levels, man. Like when we earn our first, when we earn our first, like I mentioned, 10 grand, I had this figure of I want to earn 10 grand a month. So when we earn our, started making 10 grand a month in revenue, I was like, wow, this is wild. I, I remember when we, when we hit our first like 100,000 visitors on the website in a month, that was a big number. It's like, it's for people generally, it's always like round numbers, right? When you, when you get to your first mi- million in revenue, you're like, so for me, there was all these kind of like set bars of numbers that naturally people have and you get there and you get a little bit comfortable and then you take it to the next level. But your ambition is unlimited if you set it out in the yeah. right way. Yeah, I like that. And yeah, and people truly like you just have to you just have to work on yourself and think and you just have to take time like write loads of shit down, man. I write stuff down. This is just from it's just from the last few weeks. This book, so I'm constantly writing down insights into. What do you what? So you write down sort of thoughts and things yes. that just come to your mind out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. I write stuff down. I, I, I've been I've been thinking a lot better this year as a, as a point. Last year I was so wrapped up in all the work I didn't have enough time to to put this to the test. You'll be amazed at how many answers your mind can come up with if you just sit there in silence, away from digital, and and put it to the test try and focus it and think of a solution and you get stuff, you start writing stuff down. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a case of self work is the point I'm saying here. One of my goals for this year is to get more comfortable with a quiet mind. Yeah. Uh, for some of the reasons that you've said some yeah. other sort of reasons um, as well, because you, you need the insights. And as you said, like, often we have the answers within us or we're at least able to get to a point where we can get closer to the answers. In regards to... I've got a question for you. Go on. What are you doing then to uh, get closer to that? How are you uh, getting comfortable with a quiet mind? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think uh, it is meditation because yeah. I believe, listen, I, I don't I'm, like truly, I'm not going to sit here and pretend I understand the true uh, reasons of meditation. But what, I, what I've realized, my insight, I've meditated previously, but this year mm. I've sort of made an effort. I'm going to wake up an hour earlier and meditate because then there's a level of commitment to it. It's not just I'm going to try and fit it in before I go to bed. So I've been mm. waking up, I've been waking up earlier and I've been meditating. And the aim of meditation is for me, is just not letting my mind go here or or go in the past, go in the future. Like mm. I just, all I want to do is be as quiet as I possibly can. Let that scale up naturally. Cause as you, as you said earlier, the more you practice, the more progress that you get. So I know that if, as long as I can do it a hundred percent to my ability, that will scale and the quality would get better because a quiet mind. And to be honest with you, George, I feel, I do feel I have more energy this year. Yeah. I have more energy and that could be various different factors to that. Um, I'm not, I'm not denying that, but to answer your question, meditation, silence in my thinking, again, yeah. write, writing stuff down, my journals downstairs is what I do. Is the, as soon as I, as soon as I finish my meditation, I'll get my book out. Right. What, what's my, what's my goals for the day? What's my thoughts? What's my thoughts so far? What's mm. on my to-do list? What do I have to do? Then once I've done that straight to the gym. So now my rule last year was to have the first one hour of my day with no socials, no phone. Yeah. But now because of that, I've achieved two hours. And honestly, it feels good. If I'm it's glad so that you mentioned that no phone thing because that is something I've done for years, on and off. I had to reintroduce it recently. The no phone thing in the morning, like I went to 11 a.m. the other morning without it. So good. And so I was good. still on the computer for a bit of that time, on the on the like working, but just that because we're compulsively checking our phone. I mentioned it earlier. And that just takes away from your your momentum in your mind. You get a thought, you check your phone. You get another one, you check your phone. It just keeps interrupting. So the, the phone is a great shout, man. And you mentioned about meditation as well. People get pissed off when they try and meditate and their mind gets distracted. That's what's meant to happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so it's don't the, the thoughts are not the enemy, is the saying. All you're trying to do when that happens is go, oh, I've been distracted. Back to the breathing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's oh. all it is. You, yeah. that, and this is the thing. And this is what I'm loving about meditation at the moment. Because last year when I was meditating, um, mm. I, was, I was sort of, I was on it for like a long time, but then fell off towards mm. the end of the year. But I was getting annoyed. I was thinking, I was like, this year, I'm like, yeah, no, okay. no, no, no. You're meant to be distracted and you're meant to go, I thought about that. Let it go. Let's just focus back on my breathing. Let's okay. just focus. Like, what, what, what am I feeling like? I'm feeling mm -hmm. my, myself sitting on the floor right now. I'm feeling my hands touching my knees and, and stuff yeah. like that. And now the way that translates in my life mm -hmm. is, George, let me give you an example. Me and you are having this conversation right now. My phone is next to me. I've heard it go off 10 times. Mm -hmm. I haven't had to look away because now my mind is used to going. This is it. This is the moment. I'm here with George. I'm, talk I'm talking with George and I'm doing a podcast. It's not about, oh, I wonder what that's doing. So my mind now, I'm programming it. I'm in the process of programming. We're only, only 12 days into you. I'm not going to get ahead of myself. I'm training my mind not to go, okay, that's going, my mind's going over here. Let me just bring it back. So then what happens in times of um, crisis, my mind's not going all over the place. I'm able to go, yeah. right, let's go where my feet are. And in Mate, business, you know, that's critical. That insight is like someone that's meditated for a long time, right? That's exactly it. It's like mm. you just have that awareness to pull your thinking back to the right thing. Mm. For some people I've noticed, though, it's more powerful for, for, for some people than others. And I don't know if that's just why minds are built differently. But Christian and my, myself, our he he's our head of partnerships. You just explained it in the way that we talk about it. For me and him, it does that precisely. It's like... It's like it trains that muscle. It strengthens actually the hippocampus in the mind. Yeah. Strengthens that so you can pull your attention back. Powerful. I can be on the computer with all sorts of shit open, but keep putting my attention back to that task. I can lock in. So it's like, don't, don't, is anyone listening here? Some meditation's rubbish. Thoughts are not the enemy. Give it a try. See if yeah. your attention improves. Yeah. And it's never, let's be honest, it's never going to go left. Like it's never really going to go like you, th the worst that can happen is that to be honest, I don't even know the worst thing that can happen, but yeah. 
and it yeah. ties into everything you said earlier every all those three things you said um my my as i said this year i've been waking up an hour early my days have been longer um i'm self-employed so there's more pressure i'm telling you now i've never felt so at peace mm. so relaxed and so focused on being being present and things things are moving and we're, we're 12 days in and i'm going to continue doing it i'm going to continue getting up i'm up at like 5 a.m as well so it's sick because i've got that feeling of like achievement almost straight away like i'm up an hour earlier i'm meditating and then i'm hitting the gym so like i'm doing all three of like really important things to me and it makes you feel good as well but i've also said as well george about that it's like uh, in the early days of the soul supplier i would roll out of bed at quarter to seven seven a.m and get straight on the computer because then i'd be working instantly doing morning releases for anyone listening that was in the early days morning releases the links yeah and then I'd go to the gym at 12 because I also believe in this power of the uh, morning of being quiet and getting stuff done. So I'm dynamic with that as well. Yeah. You just want set rules in life. So like, how do you do this? How do you do work life balance? Do you work all the time? You know, like do you, what do you get up every morning and spend an hour meditating and going gym? It's like sometimes, sometimes I just work straight away for six hours straight and I don't have a break. So yeah. Because like, you have to be dynamic because no day is the same that's, yeah. yeah that's no that's that's good to, and do you know what george i i, mm. I need to hear that look i yeah. i genuinely need that something which is like i think all of our biggest strengths can also be our biggest weakness and one of my biggest strengths is that i'm very disciplined and i'm able to stick to routine so when i say i'm going to do something um i'm going to do it now in business that serves me very well but when it comes to being dynamic i can be a bit too rigid so i can be like for example, like my girlfriend will be like, oh, can we do this? And I'm like, oh, no, no, I've got to do this first because it's part of my routine. Yeah, yeah, when yeah. Actually, I should learn to be like, yeah, let me do that, actually. So like something, here, this this will make you laugh. So here's something that I'm going to do because I'm going to start small then scale up. So something that I'm going to do is um, I'm going to make it a like a priority that every time I go out to eat, I'm going to pick something that I never usually get because yeah. then it's just a small, tiny little thing but it gets me out. So it gets me out of that, that normal routine or getting something that I'd usually get and I get to try something new. So um, yeah, and no, I'm really glad you said that. But look, I want to move on because I, I know that, that that was a needed conversation. I know that will mm. impact many. Uh, but I want to talk about, it's something that you mentioned on the first podcast. You spoke about um, respect and, you, and at, at the start of this call, you spoke about culture. Mm. So for those with a business, mm. I'm, I think culture is the most important part of, to be fair, pretty much everything that we do is at the heart of everything that we do. I think in a business, it's one of the most important parts to any form of um, high performance, um, mm. high performance, like accolades or just high performing teams. Um, how's that been for you culture wise? Mate. So one second, this is, this is what I say. Um, integrity is at the backbone of the best culture integrity mm. means a lot of things it means respecting yourself so you are the best version of yourself you've got integrity for yourself it means respecting other people which means being honest with others respecting their differences respecting the similarities and looking after others that's integrity it means backing your word as well trust me once you just use that word that's a founding pillar of good culture a lot of other stuff falls into place so my story, I worked at a lot of places that I didn't like. I said I had 10 jobs from 17 to 24. 60% of the managers I hated, right? They let staff go because they were all focused about themselves. They didn't mm. know how to retain staff. It was, it was a selfish endeavor for a lot of them. The best managers that I had were Ben and Jim, who worked in the recruitment company. They are still my friends today. Ben is one of my best friends. He led with empathy, knowledge, wisdom, and uh, accountability for yourself. It's like, I'm not going to tell you everything to do. You better figure it out because you're a smart person. So it's about empowering people, helping them when they need help, but not giving them all the answers. Because at the end of the day, we hire, as Steve Jobs said, smart people to tell us what to do, not to tell them what to do. And integrity, got to be honest, the old school culture of leading by fear doesn't work. 
You remember that, that image of like a fat cat in a suit telling, pointing the finger, telling people what to do. Now it's all about being the best version of you so you inspire others and leading with love and empathy. This doesn't mean being uh, passive. It doesn't mean being aggressive. It means being casually assertive in the middle and people swing between those. You have someone that's more passive that needs to be a bit more assertive and someone that's naturally more aggressive that needs to hone it in. But the point here is, leading with love, being an assertive, helpful individual. And that's that will create good culture because that will that will proliferate to everyone else. How how did you how did you get that message across to your to your team? It's like your actions, man, each day. If you're coming in each day and you're smiling, you walk into the office, you smile. You look at other people in the office, you see someone down, you walk over to their desk and you speak to them. How are you? Are you okay? If they're still not picking up, maybe you go for lunch with them, take them for a walk, find out what's wrong with them. Give each person some of your time because that's your job as a leader um, is to manage the energy of the team. I love that term. Managing energy is what a CEO should do. Shout out Nick Rickson on that one as well. He was a previous mentor. He worked with like Tony Robbins and other people. So Nick Rickson, managing energy was what he always said to me. It's a big one. Yeah, yeah. It just just yeah. Dive, just dive, dive into that just just a little bit because I can imagine that will leave sort of question marks on yeah. on some some of the listeners. Mm. It comes back to the original points of um of what are you doing to look after yourself. So the way you're going to get your best energy are if you're eating right, sleeping right, exercising you're going to be feeling good. So if you're looking after yourself in your version of what looking after yourself is, by the way, because people have different versions. Don't get me wrong. There are scientifically and factually correct ways to look after yourself, but they there are interpretations outside of that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so if you're doing that and therefore you're feeling good about yourself because your life is is in line with your expectations for your life, then you're going to walk into that office and that's going to give off to other people. Projects. So yeah, you're going to you manage your own energy and other people, therefore, will start to lift up just naturally. And then it's your job to go out and and speak to people and understand their energy. The only way you can understand other people is if you've got a good hold on yourself. Yeah. When you're all up here, your life's in turmoil. The last thing you can think about is looking after others. So it's our job as leaders to look after us first. And that sounds selfish, but it's so we can then be the best for others. So yeah, so I'm I'm hearing a lot of self awareness, lead by example. Um, that's 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 what I'm hearing, and that, I think you, yeah, I I can I can definitely see that. And you got to it's got to be done by yourself first because it's easy to sniff out someone that's not doing not not doing the work themselves. And just as we bring this to a close, mm. what do you think is a message which is out there a common a common message or common phrase? which you think is hugely mm. misinterpreted or misconceived for entrepreneurs or what perspective would you offer on it that they can shift? Is, is the point of we're too influenced by everybody else now and the power of this is underrated if I had to go down this route, which we haven't done in this podcast, is there is a that almost seems like a deliberate effort to take away our mind share, to stop us thinking in the best way. That is just so it's social media as a whole has done so many good things, but it's been so destructive for the mind because everyone now looks at what everyone else does and tries to implement that into their own lives. And that just doesn't work a lot of the time. Your own life circumstances are your own. Therefore, you have to run your life in the way that works for you. And that translates into business as well. We just uh, got over 7 million revenue this year. Wow. And I have, I have used other people's best practices in the past. And the revenue's gone down. And looking at others, what have we, you know, should we try that? Should we try that? It doesn't work for our team. It doesn't work for what our goals are. And I've had to come to that realization. Um, so so what's you, the misconception? The misconception is, oh, it's a mis, it's an unconscious misconception. It's not a saying, but it's what everyone does by accident now. A, a large majority is. They look at what everyone else is doing yeah. and they take that and they, because someone's painting a good image of what that working, like me today, 
I'm only sharing stuff that's worked for us. It doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Just like I mentioned about meditation, like I said, it doesn't work for everyone. Just like getting up and going to the gym first thing might not work for some people. Just like, you know, eating certain foods won't work for others. Just like your version of culture will be different to mine. So um, you've got to go with what you think works best. And I posted a video the other day about this. Parents are another big one that can influence us. Uh, they can be so influential. If my dad, uh, if I'd listened to him, he said, don't get an office back in the day. If I had listened to him, we might not have grown a sole supplier to that revenue that I just mentioned. One sec, one sec, Julie. So the point here is listen to your own best practices and not everyone else's. Do you know what? That's massive. And I'm glad we're finishing on that because I truly believe that social media has taught us. Oh, we've got a new guest on the podcast. <laughs> we got a new guest. Um, yeah, no, I, and I think it's so, and do you know what? That's good because I don't think this is out there. And this is, I'm definitely going to pull this clip. I think social media has taught us to not to listen to our own intuition. And, yeah. um, and I think if you get anything from this podcast, um, I'm really glad that that's finished. Um, George, look, it's been a pleasure, um, man. And again, thank you. Um, and I'm going to put all your links and stuff in the podcast for so people can go and buy from you. So people can go and support you and follow you on social media. But look, for those that are still here, look, just a big thank you again. The most precious thing in the world is time and you've just given us an hour of it um and listen take one thing from the podcast implement it in your life and you will see us again soon so for now god bless you thank you take care